Welcome to the Pop and Watch Film Review Podcast. You're joined by today's hosts, Ryan Rose and me, John. Hi. Yes, John. 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 <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, I was forgotten. Pop and Watch. Yes, you were forgotten. I no, forgotten. I was waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. Uh, Pop and Watch is a uh, podcast uh, dedicated to film review, and this is our, uh, you know, our uh, flagship uh, episode. You know, so here we'll uh, we'll be reviewing all sorts of media, usually film, but uh, we'll also delve in into the occasional. Uh, TV show or media series or what have you. Um, we also books. we also look forward what or books or books ah yes or books or books. Uh, we also we're also gonna have special guests on, and uh, you know we hope you stay around to you know, listen and uh, hear what we have to say. Even though it's just mostly review and probably not worth anything at all. <laughs> so, I love being useless. Yeah. Oh, same here. <laughs> same here. Just being a couch potato. Just fucking uh, nothing. Just being lazy all day and not <laughs> doing anything. Oh, I Can't know. Can't be it's better. Just, you, you achieve so much. I know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure many, uh, many of you out there can relate to that, but. Um, yeah, but today we're actually going to be reviewing a film, believe it or not. Uh, that film in question will be The Northman, directed by, uh, was it Robert Eggers, correct? Yes. Don't mistake him for Dan Eggers, um, who wrote The Circle. No, Robert Eggers is a director. Uh, he's directed such movies as The Witch and... The Lighthouse. I have yet to see The Lighthouse. I really want to see that. You've told me about that. It's really good. I've not seen it yet. I like it. I like it oh, more man. than The Witch. Yeah, I've seen um, The Witch. That was weird. That was weird, man. That was really weird. So, Dan Eggers, he's got a thing. His thing is, he likes to tell folk tales. And this one's no different. Oh yeah, no, the Northman so, is very much rooted in, you know. Oh yeah, continue. Yeah, so the witch is the witch, and I think the lighthouse are both New England uh, folk tales. Um, he's born. He I think he's born and raised in North New England. So this is where he's moved to a different thing. He also used to shoot always in Canada. This time he didn't. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, both of but us I were from Canada, so... Yeah. I understand. I'm a, dis I'm a bit disappointed, but I understand. Um, he did shoot it in, I believe, Iceland and Ireland. Yep. What were your first impressions when you finished uh, watching this? First of all, what were, you, what were your impressions that you get from this? So, I'm going to start with the witch. I'm going to start talking about the witch. Uh, and, and the other, and the lighthouse. I was a bit disappointed with the witch. Um, it was not my fancy. I wasn't ready for, I didn't, I didn't understand um, what I was going for the first time I saw it. And while I think the, there was a lot of hype for this movie, a lot of hype, um, I think it it is deservedly so, but it's not his best movie, not by a long shot. He keeps getting better. The Lighthouse is absolutely fantastic, and I really like this one too. What did you think about... You, you saw The Witch, correct? Uh, a long time ago, but I don't 
remember a lot of it. All I remember is the big black shaggy goat that stabs that guy at the end. <laughs> That's as far as my memory uh, goes. And and the, the witch covering it herself in baby stab guts. Him. No? No, it doesn't stab well, him. Well, it headbutts him, right? Just, uh, headbutt yeah, it headbutts him. And then uh, the daughter, who is in this movie as well. Um, I can't I can't remember her name right now. Um, but yeah, she was in she was in that. She was starting that and she's also in this. She's consistently being great. She doesn't look like the type who would be an act, a, a great actress. She looks like one of those hot girls who are just they're hot so they're in the movie. But no, she's a great actress. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, so this one is different than either either of the other two. Very much so. He got a lot bigger budget. <laughs> yeah, I think the budget he was got a big 90 budget. million or so. Yeah. yeah that high? Million dollar budget, budget. Yeah, Jeepers. yeah, that first. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get it, but jeepers! <laughs> yeah, it all fell um, <laughs> I Are mean, we getting it's, some it's, sense that you didn't yeah. like this movie? Oh no, I liked it. No, I liked it. It's just it was more <laughs> minimalist when it came to its production design. Yeah, like it wasn't, it wasn't big and flashy. Like some parts were, were you know. Like, it, it stayed more grounded when it came to the fantasy aspects. I'll tell you, you know, this right now. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you this right now. Dan Eggers has never been flashy. This no. is probably the most flashy he's been. He's very down oh, to earth. Okay. Um, his style, he, he, he definitely has a style, but it's not significant. Um, he he takes his time with every shot as you might have noticed in this movie um, and he doesn't do he doesn't necessarily do oneers, but he does long shots and he knows mm. what he wants in each shot yeah I could feel do you feel that. agree? yeah I'd agree no I feel that yeah, he. It. Hmm. So, what did you? What's your initial thoughts on the movie? Well, my initial thoughts is that it stayed very close to the source material it was drawing from, which is you know, <clears throat> Icelandic or Norse saga. You know, it it was very much a, a cinematic retelling. Not necessarily a retelling, but it was a, a cinematic adaption of the spirit of Old Norse Saga. Um, and as someone who's very enthusiastic about all things folklore, I felt it stayed very true to that spirit. Right? So, um, just in case uh, the, you know, the audience doesn't know the story... Um, so, spoilers, by the way. Spoilers. Uh, the story follows basically a revenge plot. Um... But it's also like a, a promise-keeping plot. Because at the beginning of the film, the main character, uh, his name, uh, Amleth, right? Built, uh, played by the wonderful Alex Alexander Skarsgård, uh, who you might know from True Blood and uh, some other projects. Um, was he Pennywise he, in uh, it, or is that a different No, that, that was his brother. That was his brother, Bill Skarsgård. Okay, that was Bill? Okay. Yeah, it was Bill. Yeah. I was gonna say he Funny got enough. real buff. He got yeah. real buff <laughs> no, in this no. thing. <laughs> no, no, completely different okay, people. Yeah, D different people. Man. Yeah. Um. So in this story, Amleth witnesses the murder of his father, um, who is uh, the known as the Raven King. Uh, I believe his name was. Um, he was played by Ethan Hawke. Yes. yes, King Orvandil. Yes, by Ethan Hawke. That surprised yeah. me. That surprised me. Um, and of course, he had he Willem really Dafoe too. as the fool. 
Yeah. Oh. Um, oh. Well, we- <laughs> they work so well together. <laughs> you you need oh to see God. the lighthouse. They work so well together. <laughs> oh yeah. Although that, in this movie, you only had a you, tiny uh, bit of Willem Dafoe in this movie. You got a whole movie yeah. with him in the next in the lighthouse. Yeah, no, I, I I gotta see it. I love Defoe. I love Defoe, but yeah, in this movie, you um, you get to see some parts of Defoe you wish you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> he's never completely naked, but it's pretty well, close. He, he, yeah, well, I mean, he he slaps it. He slaps it. He slaps his uh, his uh, his nether parts. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> Perfect moment for bleaching, too. By the way, you know if you've ever you just wanted to put down your face. Now. Yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, so Amleth, he witnesses the death of his father, who's killed by his brother Fjolnir, right? Who's Amleth's uncle, and Amleth witnesses this, and he vows revenge, by because he made an oath to pick up a sword against uh, any who would slay his kin, right? His father or his king, really. Um, uh, late years later, he gets raised in this group of warriors known as the Berserkers, which historically, these were an elite group of soldiers dedicated solely to the protection of the king. So they weren't necessarily raving warriors as they're depicted here in the uh, in the movie. They were essentially like bodyguards, but they were fierce. And in Old Norse society... Um, they were exclusively dedicated to Odin, right? He was known as, you know, Lord of the Berserkers. He, he would endow, uh, like the god Odin would endow Berserkers with, with this terrible magical power, or this, this, this frothing rage, but, but would also occasionally betray them. And that's a theme you see a lot in this movie is betrayal, right? It's very Odinic because Odin is, is you know, known as the, uh, the traitor of men. Right? And Odin does play a, a somewhat central part in this, not at the forefront. He's not like, you know, some Marvel character where he, you know, shows up, uh, you know, right in front of you. But he's sort of in the background, right? He's very much tethered to the whole plot in some way and in a cosmic sense. Um, so uh, it, again, a very uh, true speaking, to who Odin oh, was. Yes. So speaking of the Odin part of this movie, I thought it really interesting that they had a... It's possible that he's absolutely real in this movie, and it's also possible that he's not real at all in this movie. Well, Did you, did you get that at all? Film it, I thought so at first, but then after Amleth fought like the... Um, the Draugr in the burrow, you know, that uh, zombie, essentially, that zombie guy, he had to gain that magical sword, right? And there's that one part in the movie where he's hanging from the rafters after he gets beaten up by uh, uh, by uh, Fjolnir. One of the soldiers tries to um, grab his sword and unsheathe it, but he can't because it can only be unsheathed during the night, right? It's a magical sword. So it oh, is was meant that to what it was? Okay. That old, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, that, that's oh, okay. the because the, the I, I was which is very why, yeah. I thought it was more just like like um, I, I, like uh, how Marvel does the hammer. It's about who um, who's who's worthy. But I didn't I didn't realize that it was uh, the knight that actually caused the sword to actually uh, unleash. Yeah, no. Forget Marvel. This isn't Marvel. Marvel is like a window into Norse mythology, maybe a very blurry window. This is full-on Norse saga, right? Which is again very intimate, um, very very kin-based, family-based. Like Nor- Nor- old Norse society was very a very clan-based society, you know, and and the the virtue of honor. Uh, held, you know, very strongly in Old Norse society. So, you know, killing kin, you know, there, there was, there's a great emphasis on reconciliation amongst kin, but also vengeance, a vengeance amongst kinslayers as well. 
Uh, so Old Norse sagas are very much tainted with themes of betrayal and revenge. And it's, it's quite sad. It's, 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 in a way, it is tragic in some sense. This was a very tragic movie. It is. It is. It is. Um, very fatalistic as well, because Amleth always goes goes on about his fate, right? Um, and Old Norse, you know, the Norse religion or polytheism was very fatalistic, right? So uh, the Norse had their own versions of the Greek fates, which were the Norn or the Nornir. And they laid at the uh, bottom of the world tree and sort of spin the yard or threads or fate of mortals. Um, they actually had some, uh, they also have some connection with the Valkyries as well. Because, you know, like Odin, they all, they, they, they decide the fate of men. So again, it's very fatalistic, right? So, Amleth was pretty much destined to die at the hands of Fjolnir. And Fjolnir was destined to die at the hands of, uh, of uh, Amleth. So, because they each very much, very Greek. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well, Fjolnir, yeah, well, possibly because Amleth did kill his mother and his uh, half brother. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like there's, you know, definitely fatalist. It also could be just because the fate, fate is cruel, right? Mm -hmm. Fate is. You know, like the omelette at the end, right? What, remember the woman who takes him and, and rides off into the cosmos? Yeah, and he had a dream earlier about her as well. Yeah, that's a Valkyrie. Yeah. And they're they're known as the chooser of the slain. So they they take those who die in battle to um, Valhalla and they become what are called the Enheriar. And these soldiers who die in battle. Oh, but they I thought they just the fought day. people yeah. and. Um, what? <laughs> I just thought they fought people and were uh, just lady lady fighters, just like the movies in Marvel. <laughs> yeah, well, well, they are lady <laughs> fighters, but they're a little more complicated than that. They they are almost like extensions of the god Odin, right? So in Old Norse society, they were they're they have a lot. of... They, they follow a, a certain pattern in mythology, sort of like the warrior maiden, right? And this is sort of something you can see in, in what's called the, the Indo-European complex. Essentially, it's this theory that um, Vedic and European religions all kind of go back to one primal root, which is called Proto-Indo-European society. And you see these these themes of warrior women all throughout the, 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 these cultures, right? So in Vedic society, you have, you know, Kali, or in, in Greek society, you have goddesses like Athena. Um, in, uh, in, in Norse and Celtic society, you have Valkyries, you have Freya, you have the Morgan, um, you know, uh, they're, you know, it's very prolific. And so they're very, you know, very complicated beings. And in some ways, they're, they're extensions of the god of Odin, because they also decide the fate of men. Right. And so, you know, the implication is essentially Amleth, you know, before he was born, was destined to go to the halls of Valhalla so that he can fight with Odin at the day of Ragnarok. So, yeah, basically, he had no choice. Right. Very fatalistic. He was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, destined to die. But uh, this also kind of leaves itself open for a sequel. What? Because of the... Well, yeah. Because he impregnated the woman, right? She had two... She has two kids now. A, a son and a daughter. Oh, oh great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's totally a sequel. You can make, like, a whole trilogy based off of this. Like, an actual oh, saga. gosh. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Branding. Franchising. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so that's why it was ninety but, million dollars. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. We, we sold the problem. They're gonna yep. make those uh, vinyl vinyl statues of all the characters as well. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Funko Pops. <laughs> Funko. <yeah. laughs> I want a Funko Pop figure of uh, Willem Dafoe's dick. I'll say that. I want that he as. He never Funko showed Pop. it. But yes, he did. I, he slapped it. 
No, he had underwear on. Wait, what? Yeah, he had I underwear he on the entire time. He never slapped it. The fuck. He slapped his butt, but not his no. No, he said slapping iron. Did I? Am I? Did I watch something else? Well, they no, never showed it. Right. Okay, my version did. Did I have a <laughs> bootleg version? Okay, so I got a censored Was version. It? Yeah, I think you got a censored version. Mine showed dick. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe of, I'm misremembering. Of, I don't know. Speaking <laughs> of phallic objects, I thought they did the. Yep. Okay. I thought they did the nudity very well. Non gratuitous yeah, at wasn't, all. Uh, yeah, no, nothing like uh, Game of Thrones, really. Like, um, like what? Like, not that I'm ragging on that, but it can get like, like especially in the first season, nudity was just sort of the um, the draw that people had, or the the show had. To, that you know, was exactly the in, reason like, I quit. I saw I saw the first season and I quit there because there's too much nudity. Yeah. Well, yeah, it it uh, it lessens over time. Yeah, like when they find their stride, it's not as much. But yeah, no, I, I agree. It wasn't uh, you know it wasn't as uh, yeah it wasn't necessary because I, I think it would distract from the core of the message. It's not about it, it. It's a tragedy. Like it's a sad story. It's not. It's not ooh fun sexy time. I mean, there's a, there's a time and place for for that, but I don't think it was this movie. So I agree. I agree. Yeah, and um, so they had they had a nude scene with um, with with uh, Anya Taylor Joy and Alexander Skarsgård. Um, and yeah, that's where I was really impressed because they could have e very easily just gone gratu gratuitous and shown. Yeah more than needed they showed a butt and i think that's it like they had people they they had uh either her or him cover their front sides and all we saw all we saw was a bit of butt and that's okay i was very impressed <laughs> very impressed by the butt yes um, yeah well it reminded <laughs> me a bit of of um of Underworld Evolution, right? You know that uh, sex scene between Kate Beckinsale and uh, what's his face? Do you remember that? If you saw that movie, Un Under Rev Underwater Revolution? No, Underworld Evolution. No, I did not With see Kate that Beckinsale. movie. With Kate Beckinsale. No, okay. I did not well, see it any of the Underworld of that. movies. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, it reminded me of that. It wasn't as yeah. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of science fiction, and um, yeah. There, there's a lot of just, for no reason, just sex scenes, go into detail, and yeah, I've, I hate, I hate sex in my books. I hate sex in my movies. This one I'm okay with. <laughs> yep. Because it was also necessary for the story, I think. Yep. Yeah, anyway, well, yeah, it, after five it, minutes yeah. of talking about nudity. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was uh, yeah very well reserved. Um, what it wasn't as yeah no I agree with that I agree with that. It's more establishing their connection and love with each other. Like I I did feel like their um, their relationship did have chemistry. Mm -hmm. And um, so with the I didn't well, feel like it was uh, forced. So in the in the scene with Willem Dafoe and the father and son. They were very rugged. Um, it was not pretty. Uh, it was it was like they're dogs. They're dogs in that scene. They're all dogs. They're men and dogs. Well, yeah, Odin. Yeah. Well, Odin's associated oh, okay. with wolves. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Very ritualistic. Okay. And then yeah. with the sex scene with Anya Taylor Joy and Alexander Skarsgård, that was a beautiful nudity. Because Alexander Skarsgård, he's so ripped. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, I couldn't, I couldn't believe how ripped he was. Even though there's more ripped people out there, but he was very ripped, and he looked like someone who <laughs> wouldn't, 
normally be soul ripped. And then Anya Taylor Joy, beautiful woman. That's all I'll say. Oh, I love it. You're just admiring the the aesthetics of, of appropriate sex. That, oh. That's good. That's good. I mean, there's so <laughs> many non non appropriate things. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. Uh, yeah, I get just sick and tired of. No, it it does get a bit tiresome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dave Eggers showed me two things that he knew he could do really well: action and action. Yeah, the action was, um, it was all right. I've seen more violent films, honestly. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, like, the film didn't stand out for its violence, in my opinion. Although, it did stand out for Viking, like, uh, specifically Viking-era violence, right? So, you know, you, you, you get at the beginning of the film that, that, Alex, uh, that Alex's character, Omelette, is not this... You know, hero in in you know in white shining armor, right? Mm -hmm. He uh, he's a Viking, like he's like a pirate almost. And he, he they they collect all that people in the village there that they raided, and they they put them into the the uh, the straw hut, and then light it on fire. Like that's no sweat off their back, right? They trade people, and and it's interesting. This this film, you got to see the actual institutions of. You know, slavery at play in Norse society, which is thraldom, right? They had thralls, and it's very interesting, you know, just seeing that social dynamic. And I, I thought that was, you know, it's it's very carefully respectful, or very very, it's very carefully curated um, in terms of its historical accuracy, which I appreciate. Uh, and you and yeah, you get a sense. This is not like the, the we are experiencing Norse values right now, not you know uh, a 21st century moderns value. Right? And I'm glad they they didn't pull that punch. You know, they didn't pull their punches. You know, they didn't project their own kind of beliefs onto what is essentially a very very violent society. Mm -hmm. Right? They they showed what it was. There's no there's no romanticization. No. It's not a no. romance. There's romance in it, but it's no, not a, it's a romance. it's a saga. It is. A, a, it's... There's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, going to what I'm... I'll go into what I meant by... Uh, he impressed me by his action. I didn't think that Dave Eggers' <laughs> style would work with action films. Which, that's what I went into expecting. I came in expecting... Okay, he's gonna do action. And I think massive props to the fight coordinator. They both work together yep. to make his style and the fight coordination work together. Now a lot of directors they just let the fight coordinator do their own thing and they just don't care. Dave Agers really cared and he made his style work with uh, the fight. He does those long takes. Well, and fighting, he moves slow. Yeah. yeah. He moves very very slow, which is not in accordance to many uh, fight fighting beliefs. No, and I feel like that's like part of the violence and fighting is central to Omelette's character. Right? So I feel like he didn't really have much of a choice to you know, take a seat back on the fighting and let the coordinator do what he did. You know, it, it, it's integral to the story in some ways because of who he is. Mm -hmm. And the fighting's and what not he is. the fighting's not too grotesque and it's not too mild. He 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 could have very easily. No, I mean, I I would have preferred it for for more for more obscene fighting or more mild. It could have been more obscene. I think it could have been more obscene. I think he uh, he could have really gone too far, and then it just became a, a Robert Rodriguez movie. Um, I mean, yeah, but it, Dan Eggers is a subtle guy, and I think he worked with the subtlety in fighting. I th I think mm. he I think he nailed it because f fight scenes are 
of the hardest scenes to do to do uh, right you can go cut everywhere and it'll look bad you can do no cutting and it'll look bad um, you gotta know what you do and he's never done an action scene before that's why I was really worried and he nailed it on the head yeah, no, I, I felt uh, it, it did deliver what it was supposed to deliver. Um, although, again, usually when it comes... Like, I'm so used to, like, Game of Thrones-style combat, essentially, in these kind of uh, historical pieces. That, to me, like, if you're going to tackle something this intense, like, it, it does need to uh, carry a, a bit of an intensity with it with regards to its, its combat. But I it still felt it that. was serviceable, so yeah, I, I'd agree with you. Uh, yeah, it did. I just, I'm just saying there, there could have been ways where it could have been more um, violent, and I think it, it would be crossing the line too much. Yeah. I, I don't think it should be more violent. I think it was to its, to its uh, breaking point, and it never went over. Hmm. All right, interesting, interesting. Well, there is something. No, there's something to be said to that because, you know. So, you know, sometimes discussing the realism of absurd violence, right? Do do people ever actually get that violent in one-to-one -one confrontations or even in group battles, right? Usually what happens is you take an axe to a face, you fall down, and then it's over, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like, dismemberment is very difficult to pull off because of how insanely strong you have to be to, to pull that off. So it's, you know, there, there is something, to, again, to the realism of it. I felt like... When it came to sort of the way it approached the fantastic, it did remind me a lot of Game of Thrones in that it was really focused on sort of a soft aspect to the magic. Like th there is magic because the um, uh, what's her name, uh, the uh, uh, Olga, right? You know, uh, she she she's a witch, right? Um, she implies that she has magic. She uses it at the end of the film to manipulate the sails on her boat. Uh, so th there is a, a magic underpinning the story, but it's very soft. Mm -hmm. I very, very, mis uh, you know, it's what, in, in Brandon Sanderson terms, it's what we call the, um, the soft versus hard magic system. And I think it really hit the soft magic um, uh, effectively. And it reminded me a lot of Game of Thrones, right? Like, you know, there's a time and place where we all enjoy, like, Marvel's, you know, insane, highly fantastic, you know, bonkers, kind of all over the place uh, magic or whatever, or whatever have you. But this really uh, felt it, it dealt with the nature of the mysterious and sort of unearthly powers at hand here, at play. And I don't think it ever crossed the threshold of being too much to get what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, it's very, very subtle. Again, to to Edgar style, subtle magic, which I appreciate. Um, I know you're a very big science fiction fan, so I don't know what what, were, what are your thoughts on that? So I'm gonna go. I'm I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna. I have two thoughts. First one, I'll I'll, I'll stick with Marvel. Okay. Uh, let's talk. Infinity War, right? Yeah. They, in a science fiction manner, Marvel is also very soft science fiction. Although they try to be hard. Okay. And I don't think it ever works. Case in point, their time travel. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> they have a lot of things they try to say, and none of it works. That was a bit um, so you're telling me that Captain America can go to Asgard <laughs> and bring it back at the exact moment that it got moved? What? <laughs> um, that's not the point. The point not is, they, they tried to do some timey-wimey stuff. It it was bad that time travel was bad and they try they try to use all these technical terms which <laughs> they don't exist that's not real science like you can you can do time travel with science fiction with, with actual science um, it's not easy 
uh, but when you do it really well, it's really cool. Second thought. I was thinking about... Have you ever seen The Green Knight? Yes. I wanted to compare this movie to that. This is what The Green Knight should have been. I agree. I totally agree. This succeeded in every way The Green Knight failed. Exactly. Well, like, Green Knight... It, like, uh, it, it, it is a deconstruction of the Green Knight story from the medieval ages, and I think it, it does work in some ways, but I thought the fantastic elements were, were too weird. And I think they tried, they, they, they didn't play with them correctly, in my opinion. Um, it, it was a little too bizarre. And they didn't do anything with them. No. This movie, even though it's really soft, they did stuff with those magical elements. Exactly. And... Like, even though there was hardly any nudity in the Green Knight, the Green Knight was gratuitous in their in their nudity, not in a good way. Yeah. I mean, let's just. Yeah, you got to see the guy's uh, happy little. Yep. Jeez. Oh, oh, you're you're going to straight to that masturbation scene. Uh, that, was, that was gross. You well, that, that that was gross. <laughs> It was gross. Exactly, and it was... It was disgusting. It wasn't needed. It wasn't necessary. And, like... I guess that story... In, in what they were wanting to tell was a tragedy as well. But by the end, I didn't care. This movie, I cared. I wanted him to survive. I knew he wouldn't, but I wanted him to live. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, no, that's funny. The, uh... Like the 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 main character of the Green Knight, right? he's obviously a, a a bad character. Yeah, he's a bad person. Right, like he'd make a poor king if he. Yeah, he's a bad person. So, you know, you you don't feel sorry for him <laughs> when he goes through shit. <laughs> so it it's yeah that there there was that problem where you didn't feel like you really sympathized with the main character, but in this one you can, even though we we, you know, like. Him seeing his father get killed, you know, I've seen that dozens of times. You yeah. know, Game of Thrones we all have. softened me up <laughs> to to that to that yeah, yeah. We you know. Um But I still felt for him because he, he's an interesting character. He has flaws, sure. But he, he there's an, an intensity, a, a what do I call it? a diligence to his his overall demeanor that I appreciate. And I just felt like the main character forget his name but it it just felt like too he was too selfish and in it for himself right? it was too narcissistic yeah but this this you felt the call of duty yeah you felt the call of duty so and i both, i agree i'm both glad you brought these, up green knight because yeah yeah I, both of these stories they have a very flawed character and they're going to their deaths they're both going through a semi-magical uh, realm where they use magic to their advantage. And in the end, they both pay for their decisions. But in one, you um, well, in the Green Knight, he fails in the original story. Correct me if I'm wrong. I've never read it. In the original story, um, the whoever whoever the main character was, he had he had three three things three tests, and he succeeded in them all, uh, and that's why after three flinches, the Green Knight let him live. In the movie, right, he yeah, absolutely Sir, fails yeah, Sir everything. Who's Sir Gawain? Sir Gawain, okay. He fails every single task miserably. And so, yeah, he's gonna die. Okay. Bye. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, the ending is a bit open-ended because the Green Knight just says, and off with your head, and he just kind of drags his finger across his throat, right? So it's, you know, it's yeah. ambiguous whether or not he dies. He might have lived because... 
the last virtuous act or the or sorry the last act he performed was in fact virtuous because he removed the belt uh given to him by his mother who's morgan Le Fay, right she's the witch okay and um he removes the belt yeah and you know then like because the belt is what would like he was using the belt to cheat essentially right he was using magic to cheat oh um which is funny because in yeah in um in uh, in the northmen magic that you take you can't really cheat it it's sort of it's it's utilitarian but it's it's it has its distinct purpose you can't really cheat it right you can't cheat fate and that's mm. something you know the character learns you can't cheat fate um which i like like I like like what are regardless of your views personal views on determinism or fate it's consistent with the yeah. story it's consistent with the themes the character can't get out of what he, he's supposed to do and he and he tried to get away from it but he realized he had a duty right he was honorable like it, it really taps into the Norse concept of honor right Amleth kept to his honor so I felt like in terms of deconstruction right like you, you, there's a way you can deconstruct a story like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in a way that's still consistent with its overall themes but you also have to make the main character sympathetic you have to or like you have to make your audience care about the main character and I didn't care about Gawain in the movie not at all I didn't I didn't care like no not at all so uh, like he was a coward and maybe that's the point. Maybe that is the point, and I just don't get it. So be it. But when it comes to movies, I want to be in my character's shoes. I want to be with them on their journey. And I really was with uh, Omleth here in this movie. Mm -hmm. I, I I liked his values. At least his determine uh, his uh, diligence. I, I appreciated that. Not so much the killing and raiding, but um, you know, he's consistent. Right? He's consistent. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of any bad things about this movie, and I'm struggling, because this was a really good, <laughs> well done movie. Very impressive movie. I agree, I agree. Um, I could never in my life hope to make anything near as good as this. Is this his best movie? <laughs> I don't know. It's either this or The Lighthouse, and they are both masterpieces. I couldn't I couldn't give you an answer of either or. Interesting. On which is better. Yeah, well, I haven't seen The Lighthouse yet, so I'll reserve judgment. But, uh, yeah, I thought this film... <clears throat> yeah, I will, I will. I thought this film delivered on its uh, on its promises, and uh, you know I'm really happy to see you know uh, media figures you know um, really take a big gulp of respect for ancient customs, even if you don't agree with it or can't even relate to it in some way. I mean, there's ways you can relate to this anyway. You have to, right? So it's a modern film, but. I still appreciated that approach to historicity, and you know, for that, this film, you know, uh, gets a high rating. So, speaking of, I think we're coming to the end of our uh, of our discussion here. Uh, what would you give this on a scale of one to ten, or however you want to rate this? So, this movie felt like an hour and a half. And it was over two hours. That all that already hardly any movie nowadays does that. The last one I the last one that did that for me was the Batman. And before that, I don't know. It's been so long. I'm between a nine and a ten, honestly, out of ten. Top marks. Uh, yeah, I can't. I, I can't think of anything that I and I miss so much already. I, 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 there's so much I missed because obviously I 
I'm not the I'm not the mythology or history buff, so I don't know a bunch of these things. But I was never bored. I was always interested. I wasn't necessarily lost, and I had nothing to complain about. So yeah, ten out of ten. Well, there you have it. Yeah, I. You know what? This film again, it delivered everything it uh, set out to deliver, and I couldn't be happier with it. So I think I'll give it uh, ten out of ten as well. Why not? Yeah. It, yep. Yeah. It it all right. It shocked me. It shouldn't have, but it shocked me. To it shocked me how good it was. Because I didn't think Dan Eggers could do sec, uh, do action <laughs> so well, or at all. So this is the end of our episode, and uh, we want to thank you all for tuning in and listening to us babble on. Um, stay tuned for more. There will definitely be more uh, videos on the way, more podcast episodes on the way, and uh, we'll watch with you later.